Well, let's get started because it is the top of the hour and I just want to welcome everybody to Pit Stop, which is your fortnightly midweek rest area to refuel your drive. I'm Karen Cummins. I'm an audiobook narrator and I'm the chief cartographer for narratorsroadmap.com and I'm your host for Pit Stop. And with me in the co-pilot seat is my lovely friend and award-winning audiobook narrator, Ann Flosnick, who hosts the Narrator Uplift show here on Clubhouse. How are you this afternoon, Ann? Great. Happy to be here. Well, I am so delighted you are. <laughs> Every other Wednesday, most of the time, <laughs> maybe mm-hmm. not all the time, but anyway, every other Wednesday, audiobook narrators who do more than narrate will pull into the pit stop. They're sure to inspire you to follow your interest and use all of your talents and gifts. And I want everybody to know the conversation's being recorded. You'll be able to re-listen or catch parts you missed. And feel free to comment in the chat and raise your hand in the app if you want to be part of the conversation, because we'd love to hear from you. So thanks so much for joining us. Today, I am really excited to welcome Jennifer Jill Araya. I've been practicing your name, Jennifer. Oh my God. <laughs> Rolling your R. <laughs> Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Jill Araya is an Audi Earphones and Sovas award winning audiobook narrator who's been listening to audiobooks since she was a young child. And the fact that she now gets to narrate audiobooks for a living is a dream come true. In addition to narrating books in virtually every genre and loving every second of it, Jennifer also coaches other artist business owners, like herself, in creative entrepreneurship with her coaching community, Starving Artist No More, which is the pin linked here. And when she's not narrating, Jennifer can be found hiking, biking, running, or generally exploring her home city of Cincinnati with her husband, Arturo. I guess he probably rolls his R's too. (laughs) <laughs> who, is, yes, who she refers to as her partner in crime. <laughs> so, hello, Jennifer. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much, Karen and Anne, for having me. I am thrilled to be here with you today. I was overjoyed when I saw your email inviting me to participate. So thank you. <laughs> well, I was overjoyed when you said yes, because mm-hmm. I think I met you, I don't know, five years ago or something at yeah. an APEC. Yep. And I've never really gotten to have a nice, good, long conversation with you. So. <laughs> I know. Well, honestly, one of the longest conversations that I remember having with you was in one of the restrooms at that APAC. And you and I <laughs> chatted about music and heart playing and all sorts of different things. But like, you know, it was pretty long. We stayed in the restroom chatting for a while, but that was like the longest <laughs> conversation we've had. <laughs> well, chatting next to the sinks. <laughs> we have much to catch up on. And that's right. Because, um, you know, that was something that that fascinated me then and still does is that you started as a professional, and you still are a professional cellist. And I, I saw on LinkedIn that you you have a BA and a master's in cello performance. So how long have you been playing? So I started um, cello when I was 12 years old, which is actually pretty old for a string player, professional string player to begin playing. But I started piano when I was five years old, maybe four or five, something like that. And I started voice um, immediately afterwards, like within a couple of months. And um, so I, my, my degrees are in voice and cello performance. I did a major at conservatory. Yeah. Um, So I, I have been studying music and, you know, communicating through sound has Mm -hmm. been my life's work. And now I just do it with text instead of musical notes. (laughs) I like how you say that communicating through sound, because I, I was wondering how you got from playing in the symphony and and isn't your husband, didn't you tell me he's your stand? Yeah, we, we, the stand? we both have um, tenured spots in a local regional orchestra. We do about a concert a month with the, the regional orchestra and frequently we are stand partners. My husband and I um, met when we were playing or studying with the same teacher. So yeah, we, we share stands a lot. <laughs> So now you go through life making beautiful music together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, the music is what brought us together. I, the first thing that I, I mean, this is way off topic of narration, but the first thing I loved about my husband was his sound on the cello. He has mm. such a beautiful tone quality when he's performing and playing. And it's just, I loved that before about him before I even knew him very well as a person. <laughs> well, you say it's off topic of narration, but I think, everything we do and everything we know Mm -hmm. comes with us into the booth. So that is very true. 
I'm sure when you're true. doing a rom-com that those kind of feelings for him inform your narration. So it actually oh, yeah, is all absolutely. on topic. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. Yeah, you are totally correct. <laughs> well, I saw you. Now, this is something I didn't know that you had uh, worked for a place for a place called Club Essential and you were doing their voiceover for their customer training video. So t walk us through how did this happen of you actually starting to do voiceover and then I want to know how you went from there to audiobooks. Sure. Well, so that is actually part of the story of how I got to audiobooks. So it's a pretty easy transition. Um, when I was, because as I said, I studied voice at conservatory as well, not just cello. And sort of the like stereotypical job for voice students while I was at Cincinnati Conservatory was that we would do voiceover for the local Cincinnati businesses. Mm. Um, and quite a few of my friends are now working full time in voiceover, whether that's radio or um, doing commercial voiceover and explainers and narration, you know, narration. I think I'm the only one of my college. No, I take that back. Another of my college friends is a full-time audiobook narrator as well. So yeah, um, it was a lot of us did it while we were um, in school. And I kind of stumbled into it a little bit back door in that I was working just as an administrative assistant at the web design company um, as a summer job one during my master's degree. And they realized, oh, you do voice at Cincinnati. And I don't know if they'd had other voice majors do this work for them before or not, but they then started having me both write and narrate all of their explainer videos for their customer base. Um, so they would have one of the people on staff teach me how the software worked, and then I would write up a script and then record the script that would go with a video, you know, like showing someone going through those steps. And um, I loved it. I mean, it wasn't like the best work that I've ever had, but it was certainly better than being an administrative assistant at a desk job to make money. And at the time I was wanting to take as many cello auditions as possible to get a, an orchestra position. And it was really, really, you know, intellectually engaging work. And I loved the, the using my voice part of it. So I actually, at that time, looked a little bit into what it would look like if I made voiceover more a part of my long-term career. And that was before home studios were really a thing. And um, I didn't have anyone that I knew who was doing it full time. So I didn't really have a mentor I could reach out to. So at that point, I just decided, you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, you know, I'll do I'll do other things. And fast forward a decade later ish, I um, needed some, something that I could do for some extra income over the summer and happened to think, you know what, in college, I'm still living in Cincinnati. And in college, I did voiceover as a part time job to make some extra money. So maybe I could do that now. And when I typed in the first couple search terms, I remember one of the first ones that came back was ACX, which mm. um, I mean, now home studios are a thing. And um, I don't have to live in one of the major markets in order to make a really good living. And I dove in 1000%. Just, I, I realized that this was a possibility for me and never looked back. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I know Anne and I went to a thing. I don't think we knew each other then, Anne, when we went to those job markets at the beginning of the century. Boy, that sounds so long ago. <laughs> yeah, and in the north. Yeah. And, you know, that they were APA events and uh, where 50 narrators went and did live reads. And, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much the, what you're saying about the home studio is so true because I, I lived in Atlanta then. I always have. I am here now. And, you know, the message that I kind of got is, well, why should I hire you in Atlanta when I'm in New York and I have all the talent I need right here? And, and did you have that same experience? I don't even think the conversation came up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, we just came and read and, uh, oh, and then there were people that read in the morning and then people that read in the afternoon and some of the people that you were reading for had, you know, yeah, they go on there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really remember too much about the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. But I mean, she's in Virginia and, and mm -hmm. was able to 
get in with the Library of Congress, which is sure, sure. But for you know, you and me, and so many of us <laughs> across the country who didn't have access to that either, ACX was was just a boon. Well, mm -hmm. so did you have any training in audiobooks before you started, or you just you did so been not, a listener and converted that and your yeah, book, I had been a or? listener and the opera training, the voice training <laughs> that I have from conservatory is very, very acting heavy. So, um, I mean, I sort of think of my background, yes, it's in classical music, but in terms of how it applies to my work now as an audiobook narrator, I primarily have an actor's background. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all of the same things that actors are taught in, in school, I was taught as well. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of like I, I'm sort of set offhand a little earlier ago that I've been communicating through sound forever. Mm -hmm. I, that's really how I view it. I am still storytelling through sound that I'm creating. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that those sounds are words now <laughs> rather than singing or musical notes on the cello. But all of that is telling a story. All of that is communicating an emotion and a purpose and um, moving the listener in some way. So it's all in my mind, very related. I mean, the nuts and bolts, yes, I had coaching um, relatively early on. I think I'd done about 15 books before I started coaching, but I coached with Sean Pratt and Hillary Huber right at the very beginning, and um, they set me on the right path. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, and it's so interesting you talk about your musical training because, well, I've never been to an opera, and I mean, I know it tells the story, but I hadn't really thought about that until you just said that, that it is some actor, you know, acting going on and telling that story in the opera, because I always thought about it as the musical technical problem of hitting the notes and coming in on time and all of the things that you have with music. And I hadn't really, I know that sounds crazy, but I hadn't really thought about operatic training as relying on acting technique. Oh, very, very much so. I mean, even when I'm doing an art song or a symphony performance, I know what the text means. And there's a reason that that composer chose that text, even if it's outside the context of a larger opera. Um, yeah, I mean, some art songs that I've done, Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel would be one example. And if you don't know it, you should listen to it and look up the words. It's really good. Um, but Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel, I mean, any art song is going to have a story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, they're monologues that just happen to have music along with them. And that's very much the way that I was taught to think of the performance aspect. I mean, there's the technical aspect of, as you said, hitting the notes and phrasing appropriately where to breathe and how to breathe and, you know, all of that stuff. But that is all the baseline. And actually performing as a vocalist is so much beyond that. And it really is communicating the text and the music informs you of the emotions that the text are, is to have. Well, and now that you say that, I remember, I mean, people who know me know I'm a huge Barry Manilow fan. And mm -hmm. he had, when he first hit it big, he said he didn't know what to do on the stage. And he took acting lessons so that then he could tell the story of the song better. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that, I mean, it's obviously served him well, but I, you know, it's nice hearing you talk about that and making this connection because I mean, like with my music now, I'm still, I'm like just working on the, the technical aspects, the, the expression of it is still to come. Sure. So, I mean, I, you know, I get so focused on that and I think as narrators too, a lot of times maybe we get focused on that, like, where are we breathing or am I, am mm -hmm. I breathing loud? Is it gaspy? You know, we get in our heads about those kinds of things. Does your training give you some way to get around those kind of mindset issues? And I think you talk about a lot of these on your podcast, but we're going to get there in a minute. <laughs> sure. So um, the biggest thing that I rely on is something that I learned myself as I was teaching which is that even in cello, which, you know, ostensibly doesn't have a story, you know, unless the piece tells you like, this is a walk in the park and that's the name of the piece. Ostensibly a cello piece isn't gonna have a true story behind it. But when your focus is not on the technical 
when your focus is instead on the communication mm -hmm. and on the emotions and the underlying purpose for the music, mm -hmm. the technical things become much easier. And especially in voice teaching, if I can help my students, and I don't teach voice anymore, but I did for a very long time, many decades. And, but if I can help my voice student understand why the composer put this word at a higher or lower note because they're wanting to communicate this thing emotionally or in the story of the piece, all of a sudden, all of these other things that are big technical things make sense and they just fall into place. When you breathe appropriately at the right spots where the composer has indicated that you should breathe or the phrasing that the composer's written says you should breathe, then so much is just there. And in my narration work, I find that same thing to be true. If I'm really in with the characters, the rest of the stuff works itself out. I mean, if the character is going to say a really, really, really long phrase without breathing, if I'm in the character's head, if the character is really, if I'm allowing the character to inhabit me, then I'm going to be able to have the same breath support that the character would. Or, you know, on the opposite end, if it's someone who's crying and so they're gasping as they're breathing through this passage, if I'm really inhabiting the space that the character is telling me where they are, then that breathing is going to feel right and not be difficult. It's a little bit different with nonfiction. That's a little bit harder. That's more like a you know, professor giving a lecture. I imagine most of you've probably heard Sean Pratt's um, comparison that doing nonfiction is like a TED talk. Um, so it's a little bit different. But um, in, in fiction, if I'm really where the character is, it, it, will, it will fall into place. And I know a lot of that is probably relying on my musical training, especially the breath support part. Um, but but yeah, if you're if you're really into the character, a lot of the technical things just get easier. <laughs> they don't matter as much anymore because the emotions there. Well, it sounds Jennifer Jill as if you you've all everything that you do is done from the heart. Very much so. <laughs> yes. So everything springs from that, and mm -hmm. the technique then is just not icing on your emotional cake. Yeah. Ooh, that's such a good sentence. <laughs> that's the kind I of sentence the you'd like case. to narrate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, very well, much so. So you said the symphony has concerts about once a month. So you have to mm -hmm. practice with them, right? I mean, it's not just you practicing in your house. The symphony has to practice together. So this is something you have to schedule. So Correct. You're, you're doing that and then you're doing audiobooks and you've done about 300 of them, or I think actually more now. Yes. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So you've, you've got what some people would consider two full-time jobs. So what prompted you to want to start your Starving Artists No More business? <laughs> sure. So first for the symphony, it's because the concerts are about once a month, we just have rehearsals the week of. Now I need to practice in advance so that I know the music, but um, I mean, at this point, I've been doing symphony cello performance professionally for like almost 20 years. And so um, I know a lot of the repertoire out there. So I don't need to practice as much as I would have, say, 15 years ago. Um, so that is definitely not a full time job in terms of the commitment. But the narration absolutely is. <laughs> mm -hmm. But in terms of why I started the coaching business, I already mentioned that I taught music um, and do have a background in that. And teaching the music in addition to performing the music had always been part of you know how I gave of myself and and grew myself as well because when you're teaching someone else those same concepts become clearer and more crystallized in your own understanding as well so it's it's a benefit that is very much mutual between the teacher and the student and I've always loved that but when I started narrating, I didn't have time for as many students and narration pays a whole lot better. So I, you know, had cut my, I had cut my studio way down to just a couple students and then the pandemic happened and teaching voice, which if you all remember, there was the incident of a choir that was a super spreader event, especially at the beginning. Um, I did not feel comfortable teaching voice at that point. So I fully closed my studio down um, help the last few students that I had find teachers who were willing to work with them at that point in the world. 
-hmm. And, you know, a couple years on, I found that I was missing teaching. Um, I really enjoy that giving of myself, like I said, and just didn't have that outlet anymore. And I'm accountability partners with Gail Shallon and Marnie Penning, so two other fabulous narrators. Mm -hmm. And we all have complementary strengths and weaknesses, and we work really well as a, as a threesome, sort of helping each other navigate the world as narrators. Mm -hmm. And I was helping both of them with a lot of entrepreneurial concepts. And um, we were sort of figuring things out together, but I was also giving them a lot of guidance. And they both at one point said, Jennifer, you have to start coaching this stuff mm -hmm. because it's something that's not really out there. A lot of the business coaches out there don't really speak to the needs of creative artist entrepreneurs. It's more general small businesses or um, service-based businesses, which we are a little bit, but you know, the advice that someone's going to tell a massage therapist is not really going to apply if you're selling paintings or audiobooks or um, things that you've created yourself and are selling. And with their encouragement, I decided, you know what, it is time to step back into a teacher role in a limited capacity and share this information that they are saying needs to be shared. And I'm going to trust that and, and say, yes, I want to share that. And it has been a joy. I have really, really been enjoying working with the creative entrepreneurs who've been coming to me and um, that I've had the privilege of working with. Because you're doing it in a manner of ways, though. You're coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, and then you've had some group workshops. And I know you yes. did an event in New York after, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, or before APEC. It was APEC yeah. week. Yep. Um, I don't know if you, I, I didn't see anything coming up like that, like another event like that. Are you planning to do one? Yes. But you've also so, got your podcast and blog. So anyway, we need to talk about all these things. <laughs> Sure. So I do have one-on-one -on -one coaching. I keep the um, spots for one-on-one -on -one students pretty limited. Um, so I right now have two one-on-one -on -one students and probably would have to think very hard about accepting anyone else. Although if someone came and really wanted to, I, I'd discuss it with them. But I want to make sure that for the one-on-one -on -one students especially, I really have enough time to help them through everything that they are needing guidance with. Um, and most of the programs that I offer are longer term because building a business takes time. This is not something that just, you know, one quick little answer is going to change everything. It's, it's something you have to really put some thought into and then work on implementing that. And it's a process. It's not an immediate thing. Um, and yes, I do have a group workshop curriculum that finished up at the very end of April. And I am offering another iteration of that, and that does still have some spots available. That will start in July and go through the end of September. So again, three month period. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a blog that is really just the transcript from my podcast. So I'm killing two birds with one stone there. Hey, there's I, nothing wrong with repurposing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so however, whether you want to read it with your eyes or listen to me talk about it and ramble on, um, you get your, you can get the information either way. Um, yeah, so those are the the main ways that I that I work with people. Um, and I, I did have the one off event around APAC. I don't have anything like that definitely in the works, although I am considering doing a retreat of some sort next spring or summer. I that is very much still in the works and probably would be a year away at this point. But um, you heard I'm, it here first, people. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yep, yep, yep. So um, so yeah, I the the two things that are very much ongoing are the group workshop, which pretty much always I think I'll probably have either one in progress or one scheduled, and um, on the one on one coaching with people who Sorry. need some help figuring out how their businesses should should be structured. Well, and what kinds of things do you talk about, or what kind of problems do people work with you to solve? Sure. So um, there's two, I guess, big frameworks that govern everything about how I think of what it means to be a creative business owner. Um, the first is mindset, strategy, and action. 
So the mindset is letting go of things like the starving artist myth, <laughs> um, you know, thinking of yourself as someone who is in a scarcity situation. Um, you know, you really want to be making sure that you're supporting yourself with a positive mindset. Um, then taking that positive mindset and your embrace of the things that are possible for you and figuring out a workable strategy. And that's where a lot of my coaching comes into play. I mean, once we sort of figure out um, the, the mindset side of things, what strategy is actually going to help you make this new reality that you see as possible for your business, what strategy is going to actually take you there? What are your practical steps? And then the last part of that is then actually taking action on those steps, which at some points is the hardest part. Um, you know, a lot of times the business strategy that we have for ourselves is something that we've not done because it's really difficult for us to do. Either we feel like we're incompetent, maybe it has to do with our finances and some stuff we need to change there. I mean, a lot of creatives struggle with finances, mm -hmm. um, especially the business finance stuff. Um, and it can feel really uncomfortable to sit down and be like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out. Um, so taking action can be pretty difficult and making sure that we've got the support around us to help us take that action. So that's kind of the, the overarching framework of what we think about. And then in terms of the practical stuff, I actually have a podcast episode about this. Um, the specific, how handy. <laughs> yeah, I know how handy this is. <laughs> um, the, the specific components that you want to be thinking about as you're thinking about how your business is structured. And the mindset strategy action piece of it is something that a lot of business coaches talk about. It's a those three parts in different, you know, synonyms for those three different things are things that I've heard probably 20 different business coaches talk about at some point or another. Mm -hmm. But then what specific components make up your business is something that I don't feel that really any other business coach out there is talking about for artist business owners. Um, the specific things that artist business owners should be thinking about implementing in their business. And the first of those is a systematized process for marketing and networking. Because if you're only marketing and networking when you don't have work, then you're setting yourself up to have periods of tons of work and periods of no work. Marketing and networking need to be an ongoing process, something that's systematized so it's easy for you. I mean, marketing and networking for a lot of us introverts is never super easy, but it needs to be something <laughs> that's that's got a process for it so that you can rely on, this is how I take care of this part of making sure that work is coming to me. And something you can replicate that you're not yes, having to exactly. think of new every time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you want to, what we all want to be doing is spending our time actually creating the thing that we're doing for us, narrating audiobooks. So if mm -hmm. we're spending our time trying to write the perfect email to that casting director, that's time that I'm not spending narrating. So I need to figure out how I can make that easy and seamless and frictionless for me so that one, it will actually get done because what I find most is that people just don't do it. <laughs> and then two, that it will get done without taking me out of my creative space, which is where I want to be. Um, then the second part is well-managed finances, which is a whole can of worms. And with a lot of my clients, that's where we spend a lot of time. Um, in creative businesses, the feast or famine cycle of your income can be really deadly and can lead to having to take on lots of debt and just some some really awful things, but um, a lot, honestly, a lot of what I teach there, I rely on the profit first methodology, Mike Michalowicz and paying yourself a salary so that you know your personal bills are always covered. Um, so with a lot of my students, we actually just work through the profit first book. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, he, he wrote it really well and it's good stuff. Then the third thing would be a consistent focus on what I call your creative and financial sweet spot those are the projects that bring you the most joy creatively and that also pay you your best rates. And actually the business workshop that I did before APAC was all about just this, how to work in your creative and financial sweet spot. And the really fun thing about really inhabiting that space in your work is that over time, 
as you consistently focus on making sure that you're getting more and more work that you find creatively joyful and more and more work that's paying you your best rates, you're giving yourself a raise because you're accepting higher paying books on a more regular basis. So you're giving yourself a raise and you're doing your very best work because things that we find creatively rewarding are the things that we're going to be doing better work on. Like it's going to sound better if I'm really invested in the project, which then makes that new higher rate actually, you know, reasonable for the people who are hiring me, which brings more creative stuff my way. So it's a really virtuous cycle. If you're thinking about that in your, in your work and what projects you accept. And then um, next would be sources of asynchronous income. And um, Karen, I know you know a lot about this with public domain stuff. You know, there are all yeah. sorts of ways to get other people use the term passive income. I really hate that term it for all sorts passive. of reasons. It is very much not passive. It's just asynchronous. It doesn't come in at the time you do the work. Yeah, but, I, love, I love you reframing it to be asynchronous because yes. it is not passive. Yeah, it and, is. It is very much not passive. <laughs> you know, whether it's you know a royalty share book, a public domain book, a membership site, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's not passive. No. And no. by the way, just uh, as an aside, Deanna Anthony wrote in the chat that your pre APEC workshop was amazing. Still working on the plan. <laughs> oh my gosh, Deanna! Hi, thank you. I didn't notice that you were. I'm not paying attention to the. Who's here in the chat? I guess maybe well, I that's be. because <laughs> you don't have to, because that's what we're doing. That's so. what you're doing. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, talk talk to us about asynchronous income. Yeah, sure. So asynchronous income takes all sorts of different forms, um, and you know, obviously, we're in a narrator space. But with me working not just with narrators, you know, for artists, there are literally no end to the options for asynchronous income. But for narrators, kind of the most obvious ones are royalty share books and public domain books. And if you choose well, royalty share can be extremely rewarding. I pay my family's mortgage every month with royalty share books. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough that we could live off of it. You know, if I stopped working entirely and my husband had to stop working entirely, we would need to use savings as well. But we would know that our mortgage is covered. Like we're not going to be homeless because that is coming in every month. And um, it can be tricky to find those royalty share projects, but it's not impossible. And having asynchronous income is your paid time off. It's your sick time. It's your vacation time. We're not paid unless we're working, unless we have some asynchronous income coming in. Work where we've done that work up front and then it pays us a long-term you know, reward over time that hopefully is in excess of the amount of work that we initially put into it. So asynchronous income, once you sort of get that set up, and like you said, Karen, it takes a lot of time, a lot of work, but once you get it set up, it can really make the difference between an illness, meaning that you can't work as a creative anymore, or an illness that you have all your bills paid and you can just come right back to it when you get better. Um, Scott Brick mm -hmm. has shared this story before publicly, so I don't feel bad sharing it. But when he got ill with cancer many, many years ago and couldn't work for an extended period of time, his royalty share books and his other asynchronous income sources like that paid all of his bills so that when he came back, he didn't have to worry about giant piles of debt from this time that he was incapacitated. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really can be life-changing. Uh -huh. And then the last two components to think about are habits that are supportive, both of you as a person and for your business. So that's things like taking care of your finances and balancing your checkbook on a regular basis. That's things like sending out those reach out emails that you figure out a process for in you know, the first component. But it's also things like making sure you're eating healthy, making sure you're taking care of your body because your body is your instrument, making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure you allow time in your week to spend with your family and the people that you care about. And then finally, ongoing growth, a commitment to your ongoing artistic growth. Because none of our creative industries are static. Style preferences change over the time, over time. You as a person change over time. And I mean, 
when I'm working in the booth, I always hope that I'm one, doing my absolute best, but two, that I'm also going to be able to do a better best tomorrow. And if you're not doing something intentionally to grow as an artist, then that's not gonna be possible. Um, so at any rate, those are the six areas that I feel are necessary for creative entrepreneurs to really grow and thrive with their art and in their business. And in all of my coaching and all of the work that I do with, with creatives, we spend a lot of time on each of the six. Probably the one we spend the most time on is finances, though, <laughs> because that's such a, a really big stumbling block for so many. Well, and it kind of influences so many other things, too. Of exactly. What you, what you have yeah. and what you can do. and Right. And if your finances are not in order, then it's really hard to say no to work that's not in your creative and financial sweet spot. And it's also really hard to take time to work on an asynchronous income project, which is going to bring you income later, but not income right now. Having your finances in order makes those other things possible. But you know, I hear you talking about this and I just keep thinking about she's doing that. She's playing in the symphony. She's <laughs> narrating books. She manages somehow, as you said in your, your bio, go running and biking. And, and I'm just thinking, I don't know how many hours you have in a day. So. Do you have somebody help you with some of these things? Or are you a solopreneur doing it all? Sure, so I just in 2023 hired a personal assistant. Um, he's gradually taking some tasks from me and we're still not to the point that he's taking as many tasks as I eventually want him to have, but he's been a huge help. Um, so that helps, I have someone who specifically manages my social media. And I started working with her last summer, so about a year at this point. Um, until, excuse me, until then it was just me. Um, I mean, I ha as a narrator, I, have, I send out all of my post work. I don't do any of that myself. But um, other than that, it was all me. But the addition of the business coaching was like, okay, I can't keep doing all of this myself. Mm -hmm. But Part of what helps is one of the business components that I mentioned, which is those supportive habits. I um, have a lot of sort of habits and processes around my work that make things take a little less time or a little less energy, maybe, I guess. Um, you know, when I'm working in the booth, I am fully focused. I am not letting myself get distracted. I'm working on the book and inhabiting those characters and being in that creative space. And then when I step out of the booth, I, Gail Shallon likes to use this image, I unzip the suit of the characters and mm -hmm. hang it back in the, in the closet in the sky where the characters get hung back up. And then mm -hmm. I leave them and then I've got processes that allow the other work to happen without tons of time. Um, I mean, it is still time consuming. Typing emails is never going to be fast, but because I've got processes about it, it makes it a lot easier, you know, doing things like batching your tasks. Oh At yeah. First, I'm a big believer in batch. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, not letting yourself multitask, which breaking that habit can be easier said than done, <laughs> but, um, well, you know, you, yeah, you can't really successfully multitask. Exactly. You can only single task among multiple things. And right. the more you distract yourself with multiple single tasks, the less effective you are at any of them. Yep. So very, very true. So very true. Um, are but... your social media manager and your new assistant, are these in-person people or are they virtual people? I mean, um, you know what I mean? Are they, they like, yeah, I connect with them. I mean, virtually. they're actual people. They're not. They are, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So um, Princess, who does my social media, lives in New York. And I actually did not get a chance to meet her when I was there for APAC, which I was sad about. Um, so we've chatted a bunch on Zoom calls and email all the time, but um, we've not ever met in person. And then my new personal assistant lives in L.A. So I also have not ever met him in person um, again talked a ton on Zoom calls, so I feel like I know him, but um, not met him in person. And and how did you find them? And especially the personal assistant. I had a virtual assistant. She was she was a college girl in the neighborhood. And 
I, it started out great, but she only lasted about three weeks and then she flaked out on me. Oh and, no. You know, I, I've been reluctant to go at it, try it again in part because of that experience, but also in part because I've always been worried that, you know, if they have access to my contacts, they'll say, well, I'm an audiobook narrator too. And, you know, they'll like somehow use and abuse my info for their own personal sure. event. Did sure. you have any of those kind of concerns? And so how did you find the people who are working with you? Right. So um, for, in terms of the concerns, I guess my concern more has to do with like my own personal privacy. Um, mm -hmm. I've had some issues with stalking from online things. So that was a kind of big concern for me. Um, but both people are people who I got in touch with through people I know. Actually, Marnie Penning helped me find both of them. Um, mm. Princess has been an acting student, student, student <laughs> of, yeah, I speak for a living. Um, <laughs> Princess <laughs> has been at times an acting student of Marnie because Marnie teaches acting. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and Marnie knew that Princess managed social media accounts for some other narrators. So that one was easy. Like when, when Marnie gave me that recommendation, I'm like, okay, as long as she's got room, then we're good. And she did. So that was fine. And then um, when I was looking for a personal assistant, I wasn't just wanting someone to handle some of like the business admin tasks. I actually primarily was wanting someone who would be a long-term regular prepper for me. And that's the, the first big task that Ross, my personal assistant, has taken over. Um, so he is now prepping just about all of my books. I mean, I still do a lot of prep work myself. I read through the information that he gives me. I read a fair amount of the book myself, but I'm no longer having to do any of the looking up of words and, um, you know, worried that I'm going to have to gonna miss a detail or something because he's, he's doing all of my prep work for me. So when I was looking for a personal assistant, I was looking for someone who could primarily prep but also would have a couple extra hours each week to help with some of the admin things too. And um, Marnie got me in touch with a group of actors that she had contacts with because, you know, thinking of who would be a good prepper, well, another actor would be a great prepper. They're gonna know exactly what I need mm -hmm. um, in terms of prep material. And so I had several different applicants for the position. I had them all sample prep things for me. I had them multiple books. All of them did, I think, three or four books a piece um, so that I would understand, you know, what kind of prep stuff they would give back to me. And then also mm -hmm. um, had them all do some admin tasks, all of which I paid them for. <laughs> and then after that, which took a while, um, mm -hmm. I decided, decided that the one that I was working best with was Ross, who I, who I selected. So um, I think in terms of a personal assistant, just think about what types of tasks you need and who might be the right person to handle those tasks for you. At least that's how I went about it. I'm mm -hmm. still very much figuring out what it means to have a personal assistant. <laughs> <laughs> it's still really new. <laughs> well, I have what I like to call the pit stop hot seat. These are questions you are not expecting. Okay. <laughs> they are the best and most fun of all. So, you are a person of so many talents and skills. I would like to know, what is your most trivial, useless, or flat out counterproductive superpower? Oh. <laughs> and I, while you think of that, I see yeah. Danielle Gensler <laughs> mentions, she's a personal assistant looking for additional work, so happy oh. to help anyone oh. who needs it. Very so, nice. That's there good go. to know. Yeah. And Jennifer, I mean, uh, Lauren Peterson said you helped her rethink what it yes. means to have ongoing growth. Doesn't yes. always have to be expensive coaching classes. Exactly. Yeah. Lauren was part of my um, first iteration of the group workshop and she is an amazing narrator. I'm really excited for, for her. All right. So back to my weird yes. and useless superpower. Yes. I somehow memorize numbers just, they just stick in my head. So for example, I recently went to the beach with my parents and the code to get back into the condo from the beach was like a 12, um, 
digit number with some stars and pounds in there. (laughs) I guess they didn't want people just randomly coming up and being like, oh, I can try a bunch of different codes and get in the store. The second day there, I had it memorized and wasn't even trying to. (laughs) I just numbers stick in my head. Um, So yeah, that would be it. It it is useful at times, but it's very odd. (laughs) I don't I don't try. Do you find that you'll remember numbers, but you can't remember people's names? Yes. Yes. That's me too. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you. Is there you a my name for that, Karen? From, from from when I was, you know, ten years old, I know that phone number. But right, you know, I can meet somebody, and then I'm like, oh, what is your name? I have to work really hard to remember people's names, and especially if they show up someplace where I'm not expecting them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Having people that you're seeing out of context can be very, very difficult. Yeah. No, I I very much struggle to. Um, And actually, along the same lines, I've always struggled to learn lines. So, you know, the numbers will stick just fine. But, you know, in my acting classes, learning those monologues was always a bear. I mean, I did eventually and and over time developed some tools to help myself memorize a little bit faster. But it never was quick. But numbers, they just stick in my head. (laughs) Don't know why. (laughs) That's why audiobooks are so great. The words are right there. I know. The words are there. No (laughs) memorization required. (laughs) Well, I've got another hot seat question for you. Okay. So if you were a postcard, what would it depict? Either Smith Mountain Lake, Virginia, which is a gorgeous mountain with, or gorgeous lake with mountains all surrounding it, or the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Those are, those are the two places that I love more than anywhere else on the face of the earth. Well, that sounds lovely. Mm-hmm. They're and both pretty awesome. <laughs> Serena Scholl does not think your superpower is useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't this past, um, you know, when I was at the beach. <laughs> it meant that we didn't have to hunt for what that like 12 digit with special characters code was to get in. The, well, get yeah, in the and probably people are calling the, the owners every week like, oh, I can't remember the code. I can't get in. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, and at that particular condo unit, it changes every week, too. So if you stay for more than one week, you have to learn a new new code, which is just, yeah, at any rate, <laughs> crazy. You could be a savant. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know that it's quite as instantaneous as a savant. Like I have to see the number three or four times before it sticks. But oh, even shame on after- you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think funny. Qualify. I really do. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm-hmm. I'll own it. <laughs> right. Well, and I saw that you sang with the symphony recently. Was this your yes. first time being the soloist? No, it was my third. Oh, time with this particular symphony. The symphony is actually the one that Arturo and I are cello members of. So um, it was really nice to have Arturo on stage with me too in the cello section. Um, But yeah, no, I, well, this was my first one since the pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic had fairly regularly been doing um, solo performances on voice with local symphonies in the greater Cincinnati area. the Carmina Barana piece is a piece that is super, super special to me. My very first orchestra and choir concert in my freshman year of conservatory, we performed Carmina Barana. So I learned, because I was doing both voice and cello, I learned the soprano part in my choir rehearsals. And I learned the cello part in the orchestra rehearsals. And for the concert, I actually played cello because they needed cellists more than they needed sopranos. There are a lot of us. Um, (laughs) So I I played the the cello part. And then since then, I've performed Carmina probably seven, eight, more than that. I don't know, at least seven or eight times in various symphonies, um, you know, just as a freelance musician. But this was my first time doing the soprano solo part. Mm. And I remember from that first performance as a freshman in college, one of the master's students in the opera program at Cincinnati Conservatory sang that, sang that part. And I just was enchanted by the music, um, especially the dulcissime, dulcissime, which anyone who knows the music, it's got a floating high D and this gorgeous, you know, twisty scale up to it and it's just spectacular and 
getting to perform that, especially with my husband and best friend on stage with me, was a true dream come true. It was one of the most incredible artistic experiences I've ever had. So no, I just yeah. get a bill hearing you talk yeah. about it. It was it was incredible. And then almost even better, but not quite, our first concert of this past season was a concert with Itzhak Perlman, the renowned violinist as oh. the soloist playing Beethoven's violin concerto. Mm. So um, this season of orchestra playing was very special to me. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, this is a big year for you because not only you did that, but I know you won another Audi. Congratulations on, Thank on you. that win. Thank you. And, yeah. you know, as if you did not have enough going on in your life, now you've started another podcast, Crafting Audiobooks, yes. with Sarah Goer. So talk to us about that. What's the genesis of that? And Sure, sure. So um, Sarah Beth Gore is a brilliant creative mind. And she came to me probably about a year ago now because we, we sort of worked on it and shaped it and crafted it together for a really long time before we actually started doing the interviews and so forth. But um, she came to me about a year ago with the idea of wanting to do something in the audiobook world that focuses not on the people and not on the technical side of things, but on the craft of it, on audiobooks as an art form. And um, over time, we decided that this was going to be a podcast, and we figured out that it would be an interview podcast. And um, working with Sarah, collaborating with Sarah is an honor. She is so, she's a perfect combination of organized and creatively spontaneous, and I love it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the, the interviews that we have had so far and the ones that we've got scheduled, um, you know, I enjoy hearing what Sarah has to say just as much as I enjoy hear what, hearing what the guests have to say, which says a lot because I love the interviews that we're, that we're having. Um, and it's also, you know, in terms of you've stressed, I'm so busy. Well, for the, for the Crafting Audiobooks podcast, number one, it is super fun. I enjoy it as a like pastime as much as I enjoy it as a work thing. But also Sarah and I are both being very non-pressured about it. We're going to at least release one episode every six weeks, and we're never going to release them closer together than one every one week, one every week. But other than that, it's like when we have an interview ready, then we release it. And there's no pressure, no stress. Um, we schedule the interviews when guests are available, and we only put out a couple of invites at a time so that we're never swamped with, with interviews and keeping it very low key and doing it as much because we enjoy discussing the craft side of what we do as much as because we need to put out these episodes. <laughs> it's as much for us as it is for anyone else. Yeah. Well, that's really exciting. Yeah, I, I thought it didn't look like a structured schedule. No, yeah, there is no structured schedule <laughs> at all. <laughs> it is just when we have an interview ready, then we release it. Um, and like I said, our goal is to have one at least every six weeks. but. Um, we, and we won't ever release them closer together than one every week. So if we've got like four ready at the same time, we'll space them out. But um, other than that, it's just when we have an interview that's ready to go and the guest has been able to schedule it and we've gotten it edited and so forth, then, then we release it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice way to keep it low key for both of us because mm -hmm. Sarah is a narrator, obviously, but also has a production company and has published some books as well. Um, so. She's got a lot on her plate, too. <laughs> wow. And you've had a nice mix of guests. You've had narrators. You've had some casting directors. And mm -hmm. so it's it's good to get all sides of this issue and have different perspectives on it. Yeah, and that's sort of our intention. And we also eventually will also be having some post-production professionals on as well. And we've got invitations out to two but neither of them have been able to schedule an interview yet but they both say they're interested so at some point there will be some post-production people who are talking about the craft of the you know proofing side and the craft of editing as well um we want to look at, at audiobooks all the way around in terms of an art form which is really what it is well it's and it's not, perfect it's, timing for that discussion mm -hmm. given yes. how ai seems to be encroaching exactly. everywhere right right i mean Audiobooks are part of the printed book, but they are also their own separate and unique art form. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're not synonymous with the printed page. And I, Sarah and I both feel that there's a lot of art that goes into it, a lot of human art that goes into it, and celebrating that is a really good thing. Well, and I want, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to let the audience know we're coming to the end of our time with Jennifer. So if you want to jump in and say hello or ask any questions, better do it now before your time gets away from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and I see Chris say, I'm so grateful for not having to memorize my scripts. Me too, Chris. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it's just, I'm just amazed at all the things you do. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how you can accomplish so many things in one day or one week. Do you have advice for people who might want to expand their horizon in some way beyond narration. Do you, what would you say to somebody thinking about, you know, just even having a whisper of an idea? Sure. So um, I think there are two things that you can think about. The first is what is the purpose behind what you're doing? Um, so one of the sample questions that you sent me, Karen, was what is what is the purpose or the why behind the work that you're doing? Yeah, the big and, why. Yeah, and I find that my why really helps drive me into figuring out what is right for me. Which, op you know, like when you see opportunities come to you, how do you know whether that's the right opportunity for you or whether it's something that's going to take you off course? Mm -hmm. And if all that I had been thinking about when I was like, you know what, I want to get back into teaching. Well, teaching performance coaching for audiobooks would have felt like the obvious thing um, because that's something that I've already been doing sort of on the down low. I do, I do performance coaching when people come to me and ask for it. I don't necessarily advertise it, although maybe talking about it here is advertising it. Um, <laughs> and so that would have felt obvious, but because I had the um, the advice of Marnie and Gail. So, you know, having a support network around me, but also digging into why I wanted to get back into teaching. And it wasn't just that I wanted to teach. It was that I wanted to share something of myself and my experience. And there's a lot about my background, especially my family background. My parents both are small business owners. Um, so I've got a lot of experience from the entrepreneurship side of being a creative that a lot of creatives don't necessarily have. And so digging more into why I wanted to get back into teaching to address the shortcoming that I saw in terms of how other business coaches were talking about being a creative and to really share of my own experience, that helped me figure out that, you no, know, performance coaching isn't what I want to teach. What I want to teach is more the entrepreneurship side of things. Um, it's a unique reflection of who I am and why I want to do this. And then on the flip side of that, running a small business is really hard work. And if you don't have your reason for doing that, like really settled in your soul, it's going to be very difficult to keep doing it when the, the going gets tough, when you hit a problem or a roadblock. And then having support around you gives you the resources and also the outside perspective to know how to get through those things. So I guess to distill that down, the two pieces of advice are know why you want to do something other than just your current, your current thing, and then make sure you've got a support network that's going to help you as you're pursuing that other thing. I'm glad you brought up the why, because when you were talking about starting starving artists no more and you said oh they told me you really need to share this info you really need to get this mm -hmm. out there you know i think a lot of times we get these messages from other people of oh you really should do x and i think a lot of people even in our audiobook narration like oh you have a nice voice you should read right. audiobooks but i i love that you talked about it like from knowing why you want to do it and how it is your, how your inner person feels about it. Because if they just said to you, you need to teach these business concepts to other narrators and teaching wasn't something that you inherently loved and were thinking about anyway, 
then I can see you doing it, but then not having the heart to keep at it or, mm -hmm. you know, or just feeling like drudgery, like, oh gosh, if one more person asked me this, I'm going to <laughs> snap. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, what you sort of touched on a little bit is the difference between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, you know, intrinsic being, being the motivation coming from inside yourself and extrinsic being the motivation coming from other people or the circumstances or the situation that you're in. And both are good forms of motivation, like there's not a bad form of motivation, but intrinsic motivation is much stronger than extrinsic motivation. You know, if it's if all of the motivation to do something is extrinsic, then sure, you might go the way that other people are telling you. But you also could, you know, satisfy that same need by doing this other thing or that other thing or, you know, whatever. Um, whereas if the motivation for doing something is intrinsic and you know that this is the path that is right for you, then it's a lot easier to stay on that path regardless of the difficulties that come up. Well, you're very brave. And mm. so Karen and I have talked about many, many things. And just speaking for myself, it takes me years to come to the conclusion that I'm going to do something different. Mm. <laughs> but you think about things, I think, very quickly and deeply. And then you take real decisive, meaningful action rather than just live in a, an airy fairy realm. <laughs> and I, it's, it's highly admirable. And I don't know that all of us have that. And, and, and we don't all have to have that either. But I'm sure. recognizing it in you and commending you for it, because it's really exceptional. Because you. yes, you do so many things, but it isn't a case of how many things you do, it's how well you do them. Mm -hmm. And everything that you, you do is done to, you know, that the pinnacle of, of goodness, of greatness, really is. So yeah, I, I do. I, I, I just want to take that moment to commend you, you know, from my heart. Thank you. Thank you. I think part of that comes from one of the components I talked about that daily habits. One of my habits is that every week I take some time aside to really think about what went well this past week, what mm -hmm. didn't go so well this past week, and what is maybe an opportunity that deserves a little more looking or a little more research. And so I take time every week to do, it doesn't take very long, but just a little bit of time every week to do some deep thinking mm -hmm. about my craft, about the work mm -hmm. that I'm doing. And over time, if you're being intentional about having those moments of self-awareness about your own self and about your work, it can patterns and trends show up mm -hmm. and it can be really easy to recognize, you know, Hey, this week, these things happened and I'm, this is really pushing me to get back into teaching or, you know, when I started narrating, Hey, this week, these things happened. And this opportunity is one that just speaks to my soul. And I know that this is what I want to do. And I need to do whatever it takes to make this happen for myself. Mm -hmm. um, that little bit of self-reflection, I think, our culture is so busy and so frenetic a lot of times that we don't spend internal reflection time. And I find that time very valuable to, to making sure I'm the best that I can be as a person mm -hmm. and in my work. So. Yeah, you're, you're living it, walking that walk and, and that <laughs> thought. <laughs> we are trying no, to. No, 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 credit where credit is to you. You really Thank do. You. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not easy, it couldn't be. Well, and to, to go at both of the things both of you have just said, um, and may take a while to come to a decision, but then when you do, you're on it. And I think the other thing is, so Anne told me for years, oh, you need to be paid for how you share information. And mm -hmm. I really resisted that. And it took a long, I think sometimes it's not that we're not thinking about it or that we're taking too long to have a decision. I think it's that it takes a while for the universe to kind of stack things so you can see a way forward with that. Because like writing a book wasn't, I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. And it, and mm -hmm. it took a while, even after hearing her tell me, like every time we talked, she'd say, you need to sell this. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
but it took a while to figure out how I could actually make that happen. And well, I wasn't the right messenger either. Karen. Well, you that's, weren't, that's but you problem. were a very, you were a very key messenger and a very, shall well, we I say, persistent my messenger. <laughs> you yeah. were persistent, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm that, but I, I wasn't the right messenger for for you. But you know, the message got through because but, it was a good planted, message. You planted the seed, you know, and then yeah. it was mm -hmm. letting it kind of. Mm -hmm. sit and you know get other information and have some other messengers tell me some other things and mm -hmm. and and nobody said to me membership site it was it was yeah. like the light bulb went off you know and so uh so, but I don't I mean I don't want to talk about me but I'm just saying that mm -hmm. I I think that speaks to both of what you're both talking about that you, you do have to weigh and evaluate it. And, and sometimes you get the message, but, or you have that desire, but it's not clear cut how to proceed with it. Sure. Sure. And so like Jennifer, you starting starving artists no more built on your love of teaching, because if, if they had just said to you, you need to do this, then like I said, it, it, that really wouldn't be min meaningful. But when they said, right. you should do this, and you're like, aha, that's exactly. how I <laughs> integrate that love of teaching back into my life. Yeah, absolutely. Then that's how you know it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. Very and this is where a lot of the magic happens in life, doesn't it? Um, we think our thoughts, but it's hearing what other people say and how they're seeing our gifts. And yes. yeah, I, th I think that's where it really crystallizes true because we may not even recognize that i mean things that come mm -hmm. easy to us mm -hmm. we kind of put down like well you know everybody can do this well no actually maybe they can't and maybe mm -hmm. you're the one to help them forward with it yeah absolutely i think um having a support network of peers and colleagues that you can reach out to with questions and things like this is so valuable because we don't recognize our own blind spots. Mm. And so having that outside perspective um, just is invaluable. <laughs> yes, and you said earlier on too, that uh, you, you know, you, your triumvirate and um, the strengths and weaknesses, and that's the thing. Mm -hmm. It is, it's a circular thing. Right. Um, and normally we just hear about the strengths of everybody, but the weaknesses are, are equally, they're their own thing. Yeah. One and it's percent. <laughs> yeah. So that it was good to hear that. Mm -hmm. It was. It's been really great to hear this entire conversation. But I want to be respectful of your time, so I think we're going to close up pit stop for today. The recording will be available on Clubhouse in a little bit, and probably sometime next week I'll post it with a transcript and the links on narratorsroadmap.com. And you're doing, we're doing Narrator Uplift, your up, Narrator Uplift show tomorrow. Who's going to be on? The fabulous Andy Garcia Ruse. Oh, yay. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. She's she, yeah, too. Yeah. She yeah. will have a story to tell. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm looking forward to it. Jennifer, do you have anything you want to plug or any final words you want to share? And how should people contact you? Sure. So the best way to contact me would be through my website, the one that um, Karen linked there, starvingartistnomore.com. Um, there's a contact form there. I have a um, free guide that people can download that's about how to have well-managed finances in a creative business. Um, and there's a form that's like right at the top of the website. You fill that out and that guide gets delivered to your email inbox. Um, and as I mentioned, I do have a group workshop that is going to be starting in July um, and going through the end of September. So if you've heard me talk about some of this stuff and you're like, I need help with that, or, you know, this totally doesn't make sense with me. I want to learn more. That's the place to do it. And you can also reach out if you have any questions. Um, but more than that, just thank you both, Anne and Karen, for having me on today. It has been truly a delight. I have really enjoyed our conversation. It was fabulous. Thank you. It was. Well, I want to let everybody know we are not going to have a pit stop on June 7th, but I hope I hope you'll take another road trip with us on June 21st, because that day, Tanya Eby, 
who's mm. an author, a production company owner, an audiobook narrator of over a thousand books, and now she is a producer with Dion Audio, is going to join us on Pit Stop. And talk in the meantime, about someone. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, talk about someone who wears a lot of hats. Like Tanya is someone. I'm like, how do you have time to do all of it? The stuff well, that that's do. what we're going to ask her on June 21st. <laughs> oh, that's man. exactly what we all want to know: is how do you have time? So I do hope you all can join us then. And in the meantime, I hope you find joy in every journey and live the life of your dreams. Thanks again so much to Jennifer Jill Araya for this fantastic conversation. Thanks always to Anne for your wonderful support and your terrific commentary today. I really appreciate it. And to all of you in the audience who joined us today, I hope you have a wonderful week and we will see you soon. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.